Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second day, our tridium. Those of you who have just joined us and didn't join us last night, we I'd like to reintroduce uh, Bishop Emeritus John Ha. He is actually a bishop from Archbishop of Kuching, and he retires, but he still continues to teach in a seminary in Kuching. We are very glad that we are able to have him. Uh, I know him through the, when I was in the seminary about 40 over years ago when he taught me in the seminary. Last night, he shared with us our reflection. And today, he's going to also share with us again about our renewal. So I let us start with a hymn first and uh, to ask the Holy Spirit to be with us and uh, to inspire us, to touch us as Bishop will share do his sharing after the hymn. Thank you. Good, ev good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, nice to be back with you. And uh, we continue our reflection uh, on the 50th anniversary of the parish. So this evening, uh, we are our the co second component of the main theme, Renew, will be what we'll be talking about. Just a little recap of what we did last night. We looked at the, the first component of the theme, and that was reflect. And reflect, me reflect means looking back, therefore digging up memories, so to speak. And memories do play an important role um, in our lives. And uh, for that, we went to two biblical memorials of memories. Um, one has to do with the Old Testament Passover, and the other one, um, the New Testament Passover. And we saw that a memorial in the biblical sense is 
not just a mental recalling of the past, but making the past present without repeating it. And the Old Testament Passover commemorated um, the uh, Passover of the angel of death. The angel of death passed over the houses of the Israelites, of the Jews, and spared their firstborn. Um, so they were saved. Then the second event that the Old Testament Passover commemorated was the crossing of uh, the Sea of Reeds. Then in the New Testament, we had the Eucharist. Jesus instituted the Eucharist as a memorial of his death and his resurrection, and therefore of our salvation. And we saw that in the Bible, memorial gives us that uh, inspiration to renew, to live the present. And we live the present by learning from the past and building on the past, and we move ahead to the future. And our looking back, looking back of the parish is our own memorial. And we saw how the parish started and grew, and we used a video clip for that. And so that's the past. And it's all the hard work of our predecessors, together with the assurance that the Holy Spirit was with our predecessors as they plodded along. And that assurance of the Spirit's presence is what em uh, empowers us and gives us a confidence to live the present and to be relevant so that we can continue to grow and to move to the future with great confidence. So we saw that last night. And tonight, we take up the second component of the theme, and that is renew. And when we consider renew, what do we want to do? We want to make the parish relevant, relevant to ourselves, where we find meaning. And for that, we cannot just sit back and relax and look at others doing the job. We have to be involved. And we have to be involved, of course, in the present. And each one of us must do our bit. And our involvement in the present must, be, uh, must build on the past. We have to take into account the past. We cannot say, oh, the past is uh, it's finished, it's gone or the past is useless, it has no more relevance to us. No, the parish has come to this stage because there has been a constant building up on the past. And so we have to build on the past. And when we do that, we look at what is to come. Of course, we are never sure, entirely sure of the future, but we have that in mind and we want to build a parish to be able to move to the future and therefore we need to renew ourselves and that's what we are considering tonight so there is no need for us to start from scratch our predecessors were generous they were determined they were committed and they built the parish and left the parish as it is in our hands they were inspired they were empowered by the holy spirit they kept the parish growing, going and growing. And now we are very blessed to have that legacy. We do not have to start from scratch. We have already quite a solidly founded parish. Of course, we need to bring it further to further growth. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to have this legacy. And we are, we are very thankful to our you know, the past priests, the past parishioners, to our predecessors, we are very thankful to them for leaving us this great legacy. It's a privilege. But with every privilege, there comes responsibility. And so in the exercise of this responsibility, we are called upon to use our talents in order to contribute to the growth of the parish. And for that, we need to cooperate with the shepherd God has given us. And for, the, for this period of time, it's Father Edward Lim and his uh, 
assistants and the lay leaders of the parish. <clears throat> there are so many parishioners in the parish and everyone has a role to play and our roles are different. And we have a role to play in the very vast concerns of the parish from the mundane to the spiritual. So we have to look after, for example, the maintenance of the parish church, <clears throat> uh, some legal issues maybe, uh, paying the, I don't know how you call it in Singapore, like here we call it the assessment tax, um, things like that, very mundane things to very spiritual works, looking after the spiritual welfare <clears throat> of the parishioners. From liturgical involvement to pastoral care, we have, every time we celebrate the liturgy, the mass, the Eucharist, so many groups are involved, the choir, <clears throat> of the service, communion ministers, um, the, uh, we call them um, ushers, yeah? <clears throat> so many groups of people are involved and we have to work together. So from liturgical involvement to pastoral care, the needs of a people. Then from pastoral ministry, pastoral care to missionary outreach. As I said last night, we do not exist as an isolated entity. We exist in relationship with different groups outside. So there is missionary outreach. And you cannot expect Father Edward Lim and the, the assistant priests that he has to do all this, to fulfill all these ministries. We have to be involved. After all, who formed the parish? Not just the priests, but the parishioners. So <clears throat> everyone is called upon then to play his role or her role. Parish renewal is possible only with the presence of Jesus. And Jesus promises his permanent presence with us. We saw this text yesterday in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. I am with you always. Yes, to the end of time, do we believe in what Jesus has promised us. And how does Jesus fulfill this promise? <clears throat> Through the Holy Spirit. And in his farewell discourse, we saw this text also yesterday, last night. In his farewell discourse, he made this promise to this, this, his disciples. I shall ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. That spirit of truth. He is with you. He's not only with you. He is in you. John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. So here we have the eternal presence of Jesus through the spirit. He is with us. He is in us and forever. And that presence of Christ through the Spirit is what empowers us to do the necessary renewal, to make ourselves better Christians, to make our community a relevant community, relevant church. The Holy Spirit's role is therefore to empower and transform individuals in the area of conversion and then growth. We cannot talk about <clears throat> the growth of a Christian disciple without talking about conversion. If there is no conversion, there is no growth. And conversion followed by growth is what is, um, is the fruit of the transformation that the Holy Spirit empowers us to bring about in our lives. And in terms of <clears throat> the community, the Holy Spirit's role is to, pro to provide servant leadership, the parish priests, his assistants, lay leaders. And I'd like to take up this point about servant leadership. It's so very important <clears throat> 
for us to be conscious of this because Christ has given this command to his disciples, or not command, but this expectation. If you want to be first, you must be prepared to be last. If you want to be a leader, you must prepare, be prepared to serve. Servant leadership is what the church calls for. Not a leadership to lord it over others. No. A leadership to serve. And what does that mean? It means a leadership to be able to empathize with the parishioners, their situation, to be able to meet the needs of the parishioners, to come to their service, to come to their to their help in whatever areas they may need help. That is servant leadership. <clears throat> if the church, if leadership in the church struggles for power, that community, that church will collapse. Leadership in, the in a Christian community where Christ is at the center is servant leadership. So the Holy Spirit empowers the leaders to serve, not to lord it over others. We need humility for that. We need also a heart of love. And the Holy Spirit will give us that humility. The Holy Spirit will give us that heart of love. We need to be open to the guidance and the help from the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so having said that now, I'd like to take up two precedents in our church. One from the very early apostolic times, the early Christian community, and <clears throat> the other in modern times, Vatican Council II, Second Vatican Council. And in these two examples, the Spirit's role was very, very important. And the communities in those two periods, they counted on the Holy Spirit to move them on in their reflections. So I'll take up these two precedents. <clears throat> these are, um, I take them up um, as examples for us to follow because they set us a good um, orientation, a good direction uh, to move on. What is the purpose of a renewal? Renewal aims at making every Christian an authentic Christian and every Christian community an authentic Christian community, especially in changing and challenging times. Times keep on changing. Situations keep on changing. Challenges keep on piling up. We need to be relevant. And when we move into the future, we need to carry this relevance to the future. Otherwise, the moment we remain irrelevant, we are stunted. And if our growth is stunted, there will come a time we will just die off. So <clears throat> that's the purpose of a renewal, to keep ourselves relevant, to keep ourselves as authentic Christians and authentic Christian community to meet the challenges that are facing us. <clears throat> So the first example comes from the early Christian community in Acts of the Apostles. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we are told in the Acts of the Apostles, can we move the photographs uh, to the top so that my screen is not blocked, uh, whoever is managing this? Because I can't read the full screen now. What you did last night, you moved all the photos uh, to the top, those who are and uh, in this Zoom, is it possible? Because I, I can't read can. the full screen. You can. Uh, you have to move it on your side. You use the view option on the top right. I move it, huh? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry for that. Um, <clears throat> 
So we take a look at the early Christian community, and we are told that they, they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. They remain faithful to the teaching of the apostles. They remain faithful to the brotherhood, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. If you remember, oh, sorry, let me finish the text first. The faithful all lived together, and they owned everything in common. They sold their goods and possessions, and they shared out the proceeds among themselves according to what each one needed. You can read this in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 42, and verses 44 and 45. If you remember last night, I mentioned the church has four very important pillars. And the pillars come from the Acts of the Apostles. First, the word. And the word in the text that I quoted a while ago is in the teaching of the apostles. They taught the word of God. They proclaimed the gospel. And whatever teachings that they gave, they're all based on that gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the word. That's important. Without that word, without the gospel, without Christ, that we can't talk about a church. Then <clears throat> following that, there was the koinonia. The koinonia is a brotherhood. In the text we read a while ago, uh, the word used is brotherhood. That's a communion of the disciples. They live in communion with one another in a community, and that's the church. And they were committed to the Eucharist, the breaking of bread. And the Eucharist we saw last night is a memorial of Christ crucified and risen from the dead. That Christ was crucified. He took our place to pay the death penalty due to our sin. So he was crucified to take away our sins. And he rose from the dead to give us life our salvation. So our salvation is commemorated in the Eucharist, the breaking of bread. And that's an import, important uh, part of the Christian community. And then the prayers, of course. Yeah. So the four pillars must be there in every Christian community. The word, the uh, communion or koinonia, the Eucharist and prayer. Now, the word proclaims Christ. And the original gospel that the apostles proclaimed before the four gospels came to be written, that original gospel, the core gospel is called the kerygma. And it's very simple. You have crucified Christ, but he rose from the dead. So it's the gospel of our salvation achieved by Christ through his death and resurrection. It's as simple as that. And that's the foundation of Christian discipleship. I follow Christ. Why? Because he died on the cross for me. Because he rose to life. And in that way, he won eternal life for me. And I want that eternal life. I follow Christ for that. And I become a disciple of Christ. But a disciple of Christ is not uh, to live his life or her life alone. He or she must live it within a community of other disciples. And so the charisma is the foundation of my discipleship and also of the community to which I belong. The church. <clears throat> and that community celebrates its unity in the Eucharist because in the Eucharist, that community comes to remember Christ and remember in the biblical sense, making the death and resurrection of Christ, which was a past event a reality now without re-crucifying Christ or crucifying Christ again without him rising from the dead again. He died 
once and for all. He rose from the dead once and for all. But the Eucharist preserves the memory of Christ. It leads us to an experience of the death and resurrection of Christ without us crucifying him again, without him rising from the dead again. <clears throat> and the Eucharist leads us to prayers. And in, in my prayer, I come into relationship with Christ. I come into a dialogue with Christ. There I built up my relationship with Christ. And memory of Christ comes from the Eucharist. And that Eucharist leads me to want to build up that relationship with Christ. And I do it in my prayer. But my relationship with Christ is not only in prayer. It is also in my relationship with my brothers and my sisters in the community. And therefore, the Eucharist yields and sustains the koinonia, that communion, that brotherhood, that relationship of love with one another. And we are told in Acts of the Apostles uh, the, that the early Christians, they praised God daily in the temple. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Now they prayed daily as a community in the temple, but they also prayed at their personal level as individuals at home, wherever they were. So prayer was a very important component of Christian life, Christian discipleship, because in prayer, a disciple enters into a relationship with Jesus, the Lord and Master. And when we have, when we listen to the Word of God, and listening to the Word of God <clears throat> leads us to the celebration of the memory of Christ, which the Word of God is about. And the memory of Christ is experienced in the Eucharist. We are led into prayer, and this prayer leads us into koinonia. It builds up the koinonia. It makes us want to live together in a community and to love one another wholeheartedly. And in the Acts of the Apostles, the Christians were led to this koinonia to such an extent that they, they really held everything in common. We saw that in an earlier text. They held everything in common. They sold their property, pulled their proceeds, uh, the proceeds together, and then distribute the proceeds to meet the needs of everyone so that no one was left in need. And that was the koinonia of the early Christian church. <clears throat> now, after the, the day of Pentecost in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, the Christian disciples, they undertook a very radical way of life, a new way of life, to live in that kind of community with that kind of koinonia. And they did so in response to the word of Christ. And what did Christ say? Love one another as I have loved you. And how did Christ tell his disciples that he showed his love for them? He died on the cross. No greater love than this. A friend has for, or one has for one's friend than to lay down one's life for one's friend. Christ laid down his life for us in love. That's the extent of that love. And he told his disciples, love one another as I have loved you. And the early Christian community tried to do that. So they responded to the word of Christ and they kept the memory of Christ, which the word told them about. They kept that memory of Christ crucified and risen in the Eucharist. So that new way of life was their response to the word and also their fidelity to the Eucharist. And therefore, it was a true renewal. But that happened 
only after Pentecost, after they had received the Holy Spirit. And surely it was the Holy Spirit's power that made everything happen, that made it possible for them to embark on such a radical way of life, to form a very radical Christian community. And what happened then? What's the fruit of the renewal? We are told in the Acts of the Apostles, they were looked up to by everyone. Day by day, the Lord added to their community those destined to be saved. In other words, there was mission. That living together in that radical koinonia was in itself a missionary endeavor. When people saw them, then people were, were taken up by them and were led to want also to join them, therefore, to believe in Christ. It was mission at work. And because their koinonia was also missionary in nature, it drew people to the community, the community grew, grew in numbers. And that was the growth of the community. So mission and growth, empowered by the spirit, came out of that koinonia of the early Christian community. Now, as the community grew, this is to be expected. Of course, <clears throat> problems also grew. Challenges also changed, uh, also uh, increased in number. And how did the early Christian community um, try to meet those challenges? This one example, example of a, a new challenge as the community grew. You see the, the community was com committed to a uh, life of sharing, total sharing. But unfortunately, in that life of sharing, one group of people were neglected. And these were the Hellenists. They were mainly Jews, 